Welcome to another Changing Conversation on SGS Live, where we're focusing on marine sustainability, specifically addressing the challenge of marine litter and its broader implications for environmental conservation. A few weeks ago, on the 22nd of April, it was Earth Day, an annual event to demonstrate support for environmental protection, which has been running since 1970. One of the key points from this year was plastic versus planet, with a goal of 60% reduction in plastic production by 2040. My name is Daniel Tatarski, and we're using this SGS Live to talk with an expert who's particularly interested in plastics. My guest today is Guillaume Drillet, Regional Manager, Global Marine Services at SGS. Welcome, Guillaume. Yeah, good morning, afternoon or evening, wherever you are in the world. Thanks, Daniel, for the introduction. <laughs> um, now, before we get going, it'd be great to just hear about what your day-to-day -day work involves. Uh, I, I know you will ask me that question, and I must admit it's always a little bit to define. So I am I basically look after the, the region here, that it's a large region, starting from Japan, going all the way to Pakistan, down to New Zealand. I'm part of a global team, uh, which we call Global Marine uh, Team, where we have a lot of experts supporting basically the region in, in the way we can in order to develop basically our service in the region. And that, that can go from helping with technical training, helping with uh, inspiring the people around, helping with uh, uh, meeting our clients, um, helping in, in transferring basically knowledge, helping to connect. So it's a lot of, I would say, mentoring and inspiring, uh, I would say, mostly, uh, mm -hmm. which makes it uh, very interesting. In many ways. <laughs> Great. Um, now, before we start, I would like to point out to my audience um, that you'll be able to send in your own questions to Guillaume using the chat function on your screen. And we'll get to your questions at the end. So look out for links in the comments section too. Uh, now, Guillaume, I, I read that over 380 million tons of plastic are produced each year globally. But how big is the issue with plastic compared to the other issues that the planet's facing? Yeah, um, Daniel, that's correct. So according to the report that we have from the United Nations, we have roughly 400 million uh, million tons of plastic produced on a yearly basis. And this is basically increasing. We're expecting it to reach 600 million tons every year produced uh, by 2026. If I remember well, the, the report from UNDP, um, this is a lot of plastic. Actually, more than plastic, I think plastic waste is an issue uh, because plastic has also a lot of benefits. It's a fantastic material in many respects. Um, but, but the issue of plastic is not the only one. We have other issues on biodiversity. We have issues with climate change, food production. We have a lot of people who don't have access to food or proper food. Uh, so there are a lot of, of global challenges. I think what makes the story of plastic slightly different today is while well, we have global treaty, uh, uh, for example, the Convention of Biodiversity for, for Biodiversity, when we have an agreement for global changes for climate change, when it comes to plastic, we are finally starting doing something. Um, and the UN basically is working on this. And now we have had, I think it's four sessions already trying to, to finalize a, a global treaty. And there should be by November this year, the final meeting um, from this, uh, this intergovernmental uh, working group. And hopefully they will finalize 400, 4,000 square bracket, if I remember well, the numbers that came out a few weeks in the in the press after the Montreal meeting that they have to fix in Busan by November or December this year. So that's, that's still a lot to, to fix, but at least we are in the process of generating a global treaty. Right. And, and will that global treaty put a limit on the amount of plastic that can be produced or will it give people targets for how much they have to recycle? What, what things is it aiming to set as targets? I think, I think that's a combination of uh, how we want to basically produce plastic, how we want to recycle, produce and manage uh, waste. Today, the, the, there are a few regulations that touch upon plastic. We have Basel Convention, uh, we have MAPOL Convention for the, from the shipping industry, um, uh, including now, for example, the guidance on how to transport microplastic pellets, you know, the raw material from which you produce bottles, toys, and so on. So there are, there are a lot of activities ongoing. Um, I must admit the challenge is big to, to come up with an international agreement within two years. That was a plan. Uh, you need to find consensus, many countries, and many countries with very different background. Some produce a lot of plastic, some use a lot of plastic. Uh, some have alternative, some don't. So so they are, they are still a, a lot of, of challenge. So I wish really good luck to the people that are going through those negotiations. I know how complicated it can be. So Yeah. And, and do we know how toxic microplastics are? Has there been much research into that? 
So if you talk, if you think about microplastic as a whole, there are, I think, 15,000 scientific papers produced on a yearly basis, roughly, on, on these kind of topics. Um, there are some, some, quite a few data that show that they, this potentially toxicity from the microplastic and particularly from, I would say, the chemical that we add into the plastic. But we also have a lot of recent research that show that plastic, even when they do not contain any toxic compounds, at, I would say at the production phase, while they are released in the nature, they may actually act a bit like sponge to, to the chemicals in the environment. And then they become a vector of pollutant where they should not initially have been uh, containing uh, pollutant. Then they, they basically bring that down to the food chain and, and right. that makes the ecosystem functioning. Absolutely. Okay. So they may the level of toxicity correct right um i think that's a good overview to, to begin with but what i'd actually like to do is, is go back a little bit and just find out when did you first become interested in in the topic of plastic and, and how has that developed alongside your working life so for me i wanted since i was a kid six ten years old i already knew i wanted to work on environmental issue in the marine environment um and actually when i'm french when i started my, my school in or high school in the 1990s, I had to go to a, a farm school because at the time in France, we didn't have any degree that uh, provide ecology and, and environmental, I would say, specialization. Um, and I, I did my uh, baccalaureate actually report on pollution from farms on the water. My, there was macroalgae blooms uh, that were very well known in Brittany. Today, I've made a lot of scandals, but. Uh, at the time, I, I thought that was an important topic to, to, to tackle. Um, but I mean, I think since I was a Boy Scout and so on, I have been going cleaning uh, uh, the forest and so from uh, illegal dumping. Uh, at the time I was a kid, we still had plenty of those in, the, in, the, in Europe. And now we see less and less because we have more recycling facility and so on. So because we have a solution, we have less of this kind of problem. Yeah. Um, when I really started jumping into the topic of plastic, that was a couple of years ago. I was asked by a colleague of mine uh, from uh, I'm Arrest to, to chair a meeting on plastic and uh, shipping. I was in 2018 together with uh, the National Park Board and the British High Commission and so on. Um, and we had a fantastic meeting on, uh, on how to deal with the amount of waste of plastic from shipping, including drinking bottles and so on. And then we did that again a few years later together with the World Aquaculture Society, where we discussed a lot on, on plastic and, and plastic waste from aquaculture, because often it's mixed with fisheries. And th those are two different industries, even though both of them produce fish or bring yeah. fish back to the plates. Um, and that was also very interesting. And then in 2021, we basically start building capacity here in our laboratories in SGS in Singapore. And we build up basically a fantastic laboratory only dealing with the analysis of marine litter and, and microplastics. And that has been a journey, I can tell you. Yeah, no, sure it has. Now, I mentioned earlier how much plastic is produced an annually, and it's actually more than the weight of the human population on Earth, which, which I think sort of visualizes it or helps visualize it for people. What can be done about all that plastic? If that, if that much is being produced annually, where, where should we start? So I, I think they are, they are you, again, the most important point is realize that the challenge is really on the plastic waste. There are a lot of plastic that we will need, plastic that are used in the construction industry. Uh, we, are, we are not going to change all of this. Sometimes we have alternative materials. We can, we can use wood instead of plastic in some places. But if you think about, I don't know, the gain on the electric cables, if you think about the electrical switch and so on, plastic is a fantastic isolating material. And so for sure, we want to keep this kind of uh, plastic in use where we can, as long as we can manage the end of life. So that's, that's I would say, a standing stock of plastic that is existing and it develops according to how much houses we build or destroy or whatever. Yeah. Um, but there are a lot of plastic, I would say, that are single-use plastic. Some of them we should not probably remove. Think about single-use plastic in hospitals and so on. And there are some single-use plastic we should really think about. So think that every minute there is about a million plastic bottles or a million plastic bags that are produced worldwide. Um, this is a lot of plastic bags and a lot of plastic bottles. And a lot of these are not really used for very long. They become a waste very quickly, um, wrapping materials and so on. And the question is, what do we do with that? And if we are not capable of managing this waste, then we have a serious problem. And so I think the focus is really on where we can reduce, where we can reuse, and where we can recycle. 
And recycling the plastic would be a fantastic solution if we can do that for all kind of plastic we, we produce. So it's one of the things that we need to do if we're trying to avoid single use plastics to find solutions that are not only as good as plastic, but are less expensive. Because I, I would think maybe often if we're using something that's not plastic, it's going to be more expensive. Uh, so plastic is cheap, is very cheap, and it's not only cheap, uh, I would say, in terms of production, but it's also, uh, in, in some respect, cheap in terms of environmental impact. So if I, if I remember the discussion we have had uh, at the time of we have had those round table a few years ago, um, the emission from the producing a paper bag is, is way higher than what you will produce from, from producing a plastic bag. Mm -hmm. And if you think about the overall impact, for example, of producing a cotton bag, so now, you know, in conferences, we always have a, comfort, a, a, a cotton bag instead of having a plastic bag. Um, but the environmental cost of, of producing this enormous amount of cotton can also be disastrous huh, if it's not well managed. So, so it's really using plastic or any other material, just what we need, wherever we need. Um, that's really what it, what it is. Huh? It's spending at the right place and recycling, reusing what we can. Right. OK. Uh, now, I, I think when you grew up, you, you lived by the sea and, and so on and so forth. And I think you were a sailor. I think you, you, you were telling me earlier. Um, and you work a lot on marine litter and microplastic. Why, why do we talk so much about plastic in the oceans? So all what is so the, the amount of plastic in the ocean that we find in the ocean, actually, most of it doesn't come from ocean based, I would say, activities. So we find some pollution in the sea due to the paint on the ship, uh, fishing, fish nets and so on, the, from, from activity we have at sea, right? So me, yeah. I'm born the year of Amoco Cadiz. Maybe that I was basically made to, to work on environmental issue. <laughs> Not very far. So, uh, but um, I, I think the, because of the, we have about, I think it's, it's ranging statistically, we find data that goes from a couple of million to 10, 15 million tons of, plastic that are actually going down the catchment area, flushing down the river into the oceans. Um, so 80% of the plastic we find actually at sea is not coming from the sea, it's coming from the land-based land plastic pollution. Right. Um, and it ended up in the sea and we see it there. And we have had a, a lot of communication about how birds are dying and uh, turtles are dying and dolphins are dying. And, and these bring a very sensitive image to the people and people start realizing we may have a an issue with with managing a, a plastic waste. So again, it's not it's not just the plastic. It's really managing the waste and and, and working toward I would say organizing the the the, the way we live around those waste and, and dealing with it. Um, but I think most of the pollution that we have in plastic pollution in the ocean come mostly from a dozen of countries worldwide, and a lot of them actually in this region where I live here. Um, and so all the countries are not at the same level when it comes to managing plastic waste um so so there's a, um, the amount you use and there is amount you manage that's those are two different things no? mm -hmm. and um because you were talking before about biodiversity and all and, and also um climate change and i i assume that the plastic in the oceans the plastic around around the planet they all interact together so biodiversity is being affected by the plastic in the oceans yes absolutely yeah so so a bit earlier, I was mentioning to you the, the potential of plastic to absorb uh, chemicals and then give them back into the, the the food web and so on. And for sure, the same that happened to birds and so we had happened to the to the small, I would say, uh, first step of the food chain, like small copepods and so those very tiny shrimps. There are more of them uh, on the planet than there is insects, by the way. They are extremely important. Um, and necessarily, the, the vital rates are impacted by, by the presence of microplastic when they feed them and so Think about it. There has been even studies, interesting studies that, you know, those small organisms, they, they produce feces in a kind of a small bag. And if you have plastic inside, then the buoyancy of this feces is not the same. It, it basically increases. And so you have less sedimentation, less carbon export. And so potentially there is really a lot of fantastic research ongoing uh, in the academic uh, sector. And that's, that's really necessary because we really need to be able to measure what are the impact of all this microplastic in the, in the environment and on the food chain and so on, for sure. Yeah, no, and also I would assume that because they're so small, they're right at the very start of the food chain, so they affect the chain all the way along. Yeah, so so they, they, a lot, so they most of the plastic that we have in the sea actually are microplastic. They're not the big one. 
but you need to remember that a lot of the big ones, they brittle into small pieces, they age over time, they got weathered. Uh, mm -hmm. We see water, UV light from the, from the sun and so on. Um, and the way we measure, I would say, biodegradation uh, for the product is very different often from what is going to happen in, in the sea. So if you look at the bio, biodegradability study, some of the things our colleagues in SGS are doing in France, um, if you look at the, the speed at which a piece of plastic is going to biodegrade um, in, the, in the, the soil or in compost and the speed at which it will biodegrade in, in, in the sea, it will be very different. Um, and then when they are in the sea and they can survive for hundreds and hundreds of years, bottles can survive hundreds of years, hundreds of years in, the, in the sea. Um, they also, even when they brittle, you have a small biofilm produced on it, and this can transfer basically uh, bacteria across the ocean. That can be basically a source of transfer of invasive species, pathogens. Mm -hmm. um, also as biofilm on, on the small plastic particles. These are also existing research that have been produced by academia. So, Right. Lots of challenges. <laughs> and when, when you're talking about uh, microplastics, how, how small are the, those particles? So, so microplastic, we define them from one micron to five millimeter. Um, now, out of that, ISO separate them between LMIP, the large microplastic that goes from just, one just, millimeter. Just let me stop you there, just because I'm a bit stupid. Um, how, how many microns are there in five, millime five millimeters? 5,000. I think about it. If you take a glass of water and you look for small particles inside, those likely, if you can see them, they will be around one mic 100 micrometer. This is about okay. what your eyesight will be able to see. Right, right? okay. Um, but the majority of particles in terms of numbers will be smaller than that. So the smaller you get, the more particle you get. Right. Right. Um, in, the, in the marine litter in general, it's not only plastic marine litter, it can be a can of soda. If you take an aluminium can, it will take 200 years to degrade anyways. So right. we are not far from, from some of the plastic bottles or, or, or plastic uh, wares as well that are going in the sea. So it's not just plastic. Huh? Marine litter is everything else. 70% yeah. of the marine litter that we find is roughly is plastic. Okay, And then, again, it brittle, it becomes small um, and more and more difficult to monitor. So the, the, the type of methods and, and, and so that we have to monitor microplastic, the small one, it, in the world is, is limited, it's getting there uh, through all the research that has been done. Um, but we are talking about very small stuff. Right. Very small. So, so would, the, would the plastic be less dangerous if it didn't biodegrade? So like if, if, a, if a plastic bottle just stayed as a plastic bottle or would it be just as, just as bad? Yeah, so we, we had that discussion with some uh, uh, colleagues producing bioplastic from uh, algae and so on. And they wanted to produce a lot of biodegradable plastic in order to capture carbon. And I said, then it should not be too biodegradable because yeah. you can keep it as a stock of carbon. Then. But uh, if, you, if you think about um, the, the potential toxicity reported from, from science, the smaller they get, the more pot potential problem they are. So if, if they were not brittling in small pieces, that would be easier. Um, right. Or you need to recycle before they are too small. But they are plastic that are produced small. Yeah. Um, you lose fibers from your clothes. Think about tire and roadway particles. All those are very small particles. They are produced very small. Mm -hmm. uh, so they are, they are not easy necessarily to harvest. Right. And what, what methods exist um, for the analysis of such particles? So we, are, we have different uh, type of analysis that can be used uh, if you work with very, very, very small particles that you cannot count using microscopy techniques, uh, you will use primarily pyrolysis GCMS. So you will burn everything and see what kind of uh, markers of plastic you have in there. Um, in, uh, in SGS, we use a combination of, uh, of this technology, pyrolysis GCMS, but we use also FTR, Fourier transformation uh, infrared uh, uh, technologies. Um, uh, we use Raman. Uh, we use uh, electron microscopy. We use just basic microscopy because some of this method are not, for example, very good, again, for tire roadway particles. And so we use traditional microscopy with different approach that we have for analyzing automatically the, the samples. Um, and so, so it's really a combination of, of techniques depending which kind of plastic you want to analyze and what for. So we spend a lot of time actually with our clients trying to understand what they are trying to achieve, because they all come and say, we want to study microplastic. And you say, okay, which microplastic, what size, for what reason, 
Is it because you want to learn how to treat them? Is it uh, you just want to know how much there is? You want to know whether they enter your body? Those are a, a nanoplastic uh, to enter your uh, epithelium in your stomach or uh, intestine. You need to have basically particles that are less than 100 nanometer. That's mm -hmm. This way, at that size, uh, the, the, the microscope that we have for FTR, so they don't work. So th then you need to use pyrolysis or other techniques, absolutely. And I think, again, academia is, is working a lot on developing methods that are more and more um, precise and so. And that is really, really, really useful. Um, we, in, in our team in Singapore, we basically have, we have not invented the wheel. We have captured the best science and we have included that in our routine environmental uh, testing and monitoring. Um, and then what we do is we add what we do best in, in commercial laboratory. We add all the quality control and quality, quality assurance system and all the validation. And, and we have a proficiency test and we have obligation to, to verify that all the numbers are good and investigate if something looks doesn't or doesn't look good. So, so it's really all the quality control and quality assurance that give the value to the work we do here. Right. So you have to spend time discussing in depth the nature of the projects you're working on together with your clients. Correct. And actually, you know what is fantastic about this is while we have all the expertise in, I would say, in sampling, sampling is actually by far what brings the most variability in the, in, in the, in the measurement that we do for, for microplastic in the environment. And that's because in the environment it's not distributed uh, evenly. Okay. So sampling is really a, a key aspect of that. And we always have the sampling together with the analysis when we have clients who uh, understand the importance of sampling. Um, and then we spend a lot of time discussing the client about what are their problems, what are they afraid of, uh, what are they trying to, to, let's say, learn and understand so they can change the process. Because a lot of the clients today are coming to us because either they want to monitor what is happening out there, and those are mostly I would say global client, uh, governments, uh, administrations, and so on. Then we have the clients that are more industrial clients who say, okay, maybe we do have an impact from plastic and we want to know. We want to know because if we have a way to, if we do have generate some pollution and we have a way to manage it, we want to know how to do that. And for that, you need to discuss with them, okay, what could be the source of plastic in your environment? And we spend a lot of time discussing with them. And it's exciting because I think we learn as much as they do because we learn a lot about what they do in, in their industry and they, and they understand what we can do in ours. And right. then we try to see where the match is. And so this is a very exciting process in many respects. Yeah. I mean, you discussed before about treat, treating, say, water, for, for example. How, how easy is it to filter out microplastics, um, say, from the water that we, that we drink? So, so if, you are, if it's from the water you drink, it's relatively easy because the water you drink is clean. Uh, but if you are trying to extract microplastic from, uh, I would say, uh, the soil or from the, the wastewater and so on, then you have a lot of other things out of there. Um, so what, what we do is because of plastic don't have, I don't have, do have different densities and not the same density as the water. So you can basically change the density of the samples you have in order to extract basically the, the plastic you want. So you make them float. You increase it the density of the liquid that you use them to extract the microplastic and then you make them float, then you can scoop them out. Right. So there are a few, a few tricks. It's really like cooking. I call it the, the blind baking experience. <laughs> because the colleagues we have in the lab, they spend the day extracting things they don't see. Remember, you see you see the small particle from about 100 micrometer in size in, in a glass of clear water. Mm -hmm. um, when you have something very dirty or when you have something that is smaller than that, you don't see it. So you spend a lot of time removing organic matter, uh, processing the samples without having a clue whether you, what you are harvesting, basically whether you are doing it right or not. And so to 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 make sure that we are doing it right, we we spike the, our samples, we we inject in our samples some some small particles that we count at the beginning and at the end, so we know how much we have lost on the way. So it's it's really like blind baking. Right. Okay, so, so it sounds to me it's probably been quite challenging to develop the labs that you have in um, SGS in Singapore. So it, it has been a big challenge, correct. Uh, luckily, as I said, we have a, a super nice global team with a lot of very, very good people. Um, me, I'm a marine uh, biologist. I've been extracting stuff from the sediment uh, during my PhD, so I had a lot of fun doing it. So I was not stressed at all by those <laughs> part, I would say, of the development. Uh, but we had a commitment to our client that we will set everything up within two months. 
which sounds a little bit uh, crazy in some respect, but actually not because, again, we didn't develop anything. We implemented. Uh, yeah. Still, it was a very short amount of time to implement and to test everything. And when it comes to this, it really has been... Basically, the, the, the core of the success here has been to gather all the information from a global team uh, with the performing team or operational team here in a laboratory in Singapore. And then on a day-to-day -day basis, we change the scope. So you look at the, the overall process, and process goes from sampling to processing the sample, digesting the sample, density separation, whatever, and so on and so on, up to the end of the, the analysis. And every day you may change the scope because you are trying to find out where the source of variability in your analysis, and then you focus on this part. And so right. once you have fixed 30% of the biggest source of uncertainty in your, in your development, then you go back to the, the next biggest one. And you change all the time, which has been very, very challenging for the team that we have in, in, in the laboratory. And I always apologize to them for, for, for changing uh, the scope every day. Uh, but it was a necessity. So it's really about project management rather than, than being an Eric scientist. Uh, it's, it's really about gathering the information, knowing what can be done and what cannot be done. And then focusing on on what generate the most uncertainty. Yeah, I mean, you, you said that you originally set up the, the entire lab in a couple of months. Was that for one specific project? Yeah, that was for one project. And then we so we had the the desire to develop these kind of tools, exactly. uh, but we are in a commercial setup, so we don't develop things because it's interesting. We develop things because there is a request from a, from from a client, um, and. So th there is, a, I would say, an increasing interest from the microplastic era. I would say most of it is driven by academia, uh, but we start to see some some needs for regular monitoring. And who says regular monitoring says we need to have, I would say, controlled condition for for measuring things. You need standards, mm -hmm. and uh, internationally we start having standards actually that do develop. Um, uh, we have one standard for uh, counting fibers in wastewater from your clothes and so on. Uh, that has already been published last year. There are a few more coming. Uh, we are participating in the standardization of some of these uh, international uh, standards and methods. Um, and so I, I think I think when when you want to be able to compare from one year to the next year to the next year, the measurement that you do, well, you need to have a, some level of accreditation in the laboratories to make sure that you have the quality control. So remember that what we do is, so sometimes we do private research and contracted research, uh, but we are not a university as yes, we are a private laboratory. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and we do basically inspections or sampling and so on in, in, in addition to that. And for that reason, I will say, being able year after year to do exactly the same in control condition, no matter which technician in the lab is doing it, you will have the same results. That's re re repeatability, basically, is yeah. really the key here and precision. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something which is not necessarily always in the core interest of the university. They prefer, prefer going for innovation and trying new things. Yeah. Uh, because that's, that's what academia is made for. It's, it's yeah. science and research, right? It's testing, testing new things, right? Yeah. It's testing new hypotheses. <laughs> um, I, I just want to take this moment to remind our audience that if they want to ask any questions, they can put them in the comments section and we'll be getting to those quite soon. Um, but just going back to the, the lab, um, Gil, you've received an accreditation for the analysis you do in the lab. H how has that changed your business? So, the, so normally you will get an accreditation against an international standard, but because there were no international standard at the time we were running the, the testing in the laboratory, we basically force ourselves to work into standardizing everything, measuring everything, validating everything, ensuring that we are actually doing it right. Um, and when we finish the development of the method and we're running, uh, I would say smoothly uh, our projects, because at the time we start to have more projects as well, um, I realized that if we were pushing the team to go through an accreditation step, uh, you can be um, accredited against your internal methods uh, if you have all the validation, um, this will force one thing. This will force that in case there are any potential issue, a team here from a quality control, quality assurance uh, point of view, they have to take into account 
or they have to basically start an investigation and take into account what has been done to understand where things potentially could have gone wrong. And that is really, I would say, a, a key for us because we want to ensure quality and trustability. And having that, I would say, um, accreditation put us in a situation where we cannot run away. We have to make, get it right every time. And, and I think that's a beautiful way forward to, to improving uh, uh, testing in general and ensuring you always have a high quality. Right. I don't think it changes in short term the business, but it's more of a commitment that we have in the company that we yeah. will always give a high quality. That's, yeah, that's yeah. what. Yeah. And what, what are the next steps then? So the next step, well, we, we continue developing new capacity. As I said, now the, the, the funny part is to, to work on uh, tire road wear particles because they are uh, almost impossible to, to measure using the traditional method except paralysis GCMS. But paralysis GCMS doesn't give you counts. It gives you quantity. And I think you need to always to be careful with when you just have the counts as a, as a report because the smaller you get, the more counts you have. So I think it's important to report always counts and an estimated uh, amount, quantity, in a gram or in volume or whatever of different plastic. I think that's important. Um, and then we have also the, the need to continue consolidating the capacity we have to monitor plastic in different metrics. So, so far, we, are, we have been working a lot with a sand, sediment, water, marine water, fresh water, and so on. But we have been starting working, for example, with the aquaculture industry, monitoring microplastic in fish farms and in, in mussels and so on. These are different challenges. Um, but it has been very nice to see that actually in fish farms, in some cases, we have much less plastic than we have in the environment, uh, which is nice. I think it's a, it's a, it was a, a nice output here. Um, and that was because we were working with far farms that are basically treating the water on a continuous basis. So they remove plastic continuously. Um, yes. And again, I think we spend a lot of time doing awareness, at least I do. So I go and, and, and discuss basically what we are doing in the private industry together with the people at the university. So I go and give a lecture here and then for my colleagues that were still in academia. Um, and I go to the schools. I went to, uh, for example, the schools where my daughter is, and I talk about microplastic. And I have small samples with me. I bring with me small samples of, uh, of plastics and nurdles. Maybe you can see nurdles here. I don't know if you see very well. These are the raw material from, uh, from plastic. Right. Um, before, before we actually mold them in anything, uh, we use them internally for our calibration. So we do cryo cryomiling, and we use them for calibrating our, our testing. But we also use them to explain the people where the plastic they, they find on the beach and so is coming from. Right. Uh, so I think raising the awareness is, is very important. Um, and that now we are almost looping back into the question that you had at the beginning uh, <laughs> about what we do with the plastic and managing the plastic. I think it's mainly training the people to realize where the challenges are, where the potential problem are with what we do on a day to day basis. So we don't want to stop living, but maybe there are changes in our behavior that we can start. Mm -hmm. um, and, and educating kids is easy to change their behavior. It's more difficult to change the behavior of the adults, the grown-up, than um, sometimes more difficult to, to uh, adjust to changes. But I think, I think we have to, to, to think about those uh, aspects as well. Yeah, and, and with, with one thing I was meant to ask earlier, actually, with plastic coming into the food chain, how, how much plastic would I be eating on a, on a weekly basis, maybe? Do we, so do we know? For the story, yeah, yeah, the story is we eat a, about a credit card of uh, plastic uh, on a weekly basis. And I was checking that from also some, uh, some published data on how much plastic we find uh, on the, at the end of the, the digestive system, uh, let's say. Um, and yeah, that's, that could be up to this amount in, uh, based on the data that have been produced. Um, necessarily, we are, we, are, we are talking about things that have a high measurement uncertainty here, but uh, yeah. What, where you live, what you eat, how you live. Um, in general, FAO has been doing quite a bit of study, for example, on the potential influence of plastic on, on health. And it has never been uh, raised as a very, very big issue, especially for aquaculture. So a lot of people have been very stressed about uh, oysters and mussels because they see them as filter feeder and potentially containing a lot of plastic. Uh, but all the health issues or health uh, studies that have been done show that it's still much better to eat seafood than not to eat any, uh, even though some of them may contain a bit of plastic, but we find plastic everywhere, in, in plastic bottles, in beer, in uh, food, uh, everywhere we find microplastic. We breeze it, we, it's, it's really, really everywhere.
Yeah. So, so next time I can't find my credit card, the answer is I've probably eaten it. <laughs> Could be. <laughs> we're we're, we're going to take a moment now to, to go to some of the questions that we've got coming in from our audience. I think they are going to come up on screen in a moment. Um, but let me just see if I can find them. Okay. So, so here's the first one. What is your approach to plastic recycled, downcycled, and to the laws to ban single-use plastic? So it, it's not, I would say it's not my, my role to make the rules. So <laughs> there are countries where the rules will be made in order to forbid, for example, single-use plastic, ban it. There are some countries that have already done it. Mm -hmm. um, and then in terms of recycling, we see, so not only that there are incentives to, to build recycling facility and it start to be financially interesting. Actually, there was a statement, if I remember well, it's a, uh, from the um, end of plastic waste uh, organization that was saying that there are 100 million or so already billion dollar potential market for recycling plastic. And so they, there is a potential loss of opportunity here in terms of developing business, just not to recycle. So yeah. remember, we, we are recycling less than 10 percent globally of all the plastic we produce. Most of the plastic is either incinerated, but 15 to 20 percent or it's landfill. Yeah. So technically, if you will reuse this plastic, you will you you could potentially have a, a nice market, and that can be driven just by making the right regulations. Right, and and is it possible to to turn it back into what it? Because I, I believe plastic originally comes from oil. Is it possible to um, deconstruct it and, and make it back into oil? Yeah, so that polymer, so you could go back to to monomers and 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 oil. So there are a few companies that are trying to recycle plastic into oil. Actually, SGS, we have been supporting a, an NGO starting doing this kind of activity in France, in Marseille, if I remember well, in a couple of years ago, three, four years ago, as part of our, our sustainability uh, support to the, to the community. Um, and I, I, think the, I think this is also something that will be possible, but there is a lot of, I would say, recycling, recycled product or product you could do with recycled plastic. And there are also certification that SGS is doing when it comes to uh, uh, certifying the amount of, of recycled plastic into product. If I remember well, it's called ICC Plus. Right. Okay. Yes. Well, um, let's see if we've got another question from the audience, which should be coming up on screen. Um, another one from Laura Maria Diaz. Thank you for that. Um, how should the big companies that use and produce single-use plastics be held accountable for the pollution they cause and the waste management in the places they affect? I feel that there's no accountability from the big companies. Uh -huh. that's a that's a good question and actually i would not i would say it's not only the big company it's all the companies so so one of the so for sure you should when you produce a plastic or you sell some product with plastic you should be uh, offering a solution for the end of life of plastic or account for that um, and there are some countries where we start to have regulation for this but it's also true for the small companies small companies are also producing plastic and we are counting a lot of small companies so they may look, I would say, financially less capable of managing the plastic. Um, but when we had a round table on plastic in, in uh, aquaculture a few years ago, there were some very nice comments about how to make plastic register. And so even at small, small scale company, SME size, you can actually make a register of where you use plastic and what kind of plastic you use and what do you do with the plastic you have in the house and then you can actually even at small scale start managing your plastic in a, a bit of a better way uh, so it's not only large company um, i think for large company it's easier to regulate maybe uh, through regulation to force everyone to do but you cannot force a big company to do something and not force a small company to do a little bit at least mm. but i suppose so, maybe, maybe it's it's quicker to have a big impact if you make a few big companies make changes than to make thousands of little companies make changes yeah, and I think large company, including ours, we have a responsibility to show the way. Um, and, you know, for us, this is why we have been working so much on sustainability and we are carbon neutral since 2014. And so it's really when you are a large corporation, you have to show the way. You have to be an example. You, this is basically how you lead. You lead by example. Yeah. OK, let's, let's see if we've got any more questions from the audience. Um, what is the trend of regulations about microplastic around the world now? I think you sort of covered that, but is there anything more to add? Yeah, I know. I know there are a few regulations, mostly in Europe, that actually bringing the, I said, the monitoring of microplastic uh, um, to the to the board, so that that will become eventually or has already become a requirement. 
uh, in some places. And we, we, we start to see, I would say, really more interest from the industry in really understanding how much they are generating or potentially polluting as microplastic because those regulations are coming. Whether they like it or not, they, they are coming because they, they need to come. So, so I think every, even if in countries where the regulation are not there yet, the interest is starting uh, increasing. Absolutely. Right. Okay. And I think we have one more question from the audience. Um, what do you think about bioplastics and their degradation? Um, there's, uh, there are some, there are same impacts. Um, so I, again, I was mentioning about biodegradation a little bit earlier. Um, I'm not the biodegradation uh, experts. We have uh, those uh, in, uh, in other laboratories in the network, but uh, whether you are talking about the plastic from, uh, from uh, petroleum or you are talking about bioplastic from algae or whatever, uh, these are still polymers. So technically they, they, they are still potentially uh, polluting, so they need to be managed anyway. The, the big difference is one is, is coming from, from sources that we want to, I would say, limit in terms of usage. Um, so we prefer reusing what we have already as carbon in, a, in the biosphere. Um, I think uh, um, overall they have the the same potential impact. And so evaluating the biodegradability in different environment or in the environment where they are going to end up. So either in landfill or in the sea or wherever they are going to end up, that's very important because it allows us actually to make estimation of how much potential uh, issues we are going to have long-term depending on how fast they degrade and so on. Yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, we've talked about what um, governments are going to be doing with regulation. We've talked about what big companies and small companies maybe have to do. Um, for, for everyone watching, may, what are three things maybe that, that everyone watching should think about and, and how they can they can help with the situation? You're asking me what I could uh, suggest? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, what yeah. I, have I have mentioned it a little bit earlier. Um, yeah. You know, we always go back to the same story with the kids, uh, the triple R, you know reuse reduce recycle um, i think i think the most important is really to to be curious and 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 look for all the information we have not about microplastic but about pollution in general and be aware of what our uh, habits act actually potentially generate as impact on the environment in which we live uh, because if we want our kids to be able to live a happy life we need to make sure that the earth is not totally uh, destroyed before that uh, so it's, it's not just microplastic, but it's about really all what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. It's about our, our carbon footprint. It's about what we eat. It's about uh, uh, really, really how we live. So, so I think it, it's mainly about awareness and then try to think about if something is still of value and something is still working, that, well, don't dump it. Maybe someone needs it. So you can give it away. You can resell it. There are many, many, I would say, uh, ways to, to do that. Um, at the end of the day, I think it's just living as a, as a good human, thinking and realizing that we are not the, the only one on the planet. We are eight billions. So there needs to be a little bit for everyone. And yeah. everyone have, uh, have the right to have the same uh, chances to have a, a good life. So, so we need to readjust according to, to what's coming here. And there will be some changes in the way we live on a day to day basis for sure. Okay, I think that, that's maybe where we're going to have to end it. The, we've mentioned that the half-life of plastic is about 100 years, but the, the half-life of this webinar is, is much shorter, and we have come to the end of our time. I'd like to thank you, Guillaume Drillet, for guiding me through the world of plastics in the ocean and making sure I've reached the shore unharmed. Um, so thank you, for, thank you for, for helping me out there. Thank you all for watching and sending in your questions. Um, any that we've not answered during the session, we will make sure to send responses direct to you. Um, as we've seen, plastics are only part of the story, but hopefully, hopefully we've shown you how small things done by many people can make a big difference for the future of the planet. Thank you very much for watching. My name is Daniel Tatarski. I'll see you again soon. Goodbye for now.